Hey guys, I found this old book in a deconsecrated church that had been demolished nearby my house, and I found it in the rubble, and it's a history of demonology, which I thought would be perfect for you know, researching a D&D &D adventure. Do not open the book. Why not? It is forbidden. Forbidden? It's just a book. You have been warned. Oh, what's the worst thing that can happen if I open this book? You know, on second thought, I think I'll just leave it alone. Hello again, folks. K.R. King here, helping you homebrew your own D&D &D campaign. So today's topic is the forbidden. These are places, you know, items or knowledge that are dangerous to, you know, visit, use, or to know. You know, and the Forbidden is an excellent source of D&D, you know, adventure hooks or encounters because there is an implicit threat to them. You know, whether that threat is from, you know, the Forbidden place or item itself or for whoever, you know, controls it or made it and doesn't want anyone to use it. And in my opener, I showed a clip, you know, from the first Raiders of the Lost Ark where the group of Nazis open up the Ark of the Covenant and get theirs. Now, the historical, you know, record or mythology, whatever you want to say of the Ark of the Covenant is that uh, when the Philistines stole it, uh, they, you know, had um, bad luck. They lost a bunch of battles. Uh, but I was never supposed to have such, you know, fantastical powers. Uh, but the movie version does point out a basic idea about forbidden items such that only certain groups, in this case the Israelites, are allowed to use it. Anyone else, you know, gets their face melted. Now, of course, there are some forbidden uh, places, items, or knowledge that are just simply unsafe for all. And there are, you know, forbidden things that uh, you have to have some uh, protective devices or know something about them in order to use them or visit them. So what I'm going to do today is break this discussion into three categories of forbidden. You have forbidden places, forbidden items, and forbidden knowledge. And then I'm going to talk about uh, three subcategories within each. You know, the forbidden that is cursed, the forbidden that is simply too powerful for people to use, and the forbidden that someone wants to protect. And then finally what I'll do is talk about when you're creating a forbidden place item or knowledge, how to, you know, think about it in advance, what makes up, you know, a logical story for a forbidden place or item, uh, and then how you present it to the players. Because what you want to make sure you do is you get as much of the aura, you know, the sort of dread and, you know, a malevolence of the forbidden. You want to express that for your players. All right, so I'm going to start with the forbidden place. And of course, this, you know, there's such a scope to this conceit because a forbidden place could be a huge geographical area such that it could be, you know, a whole campaign setting or many sessions uh, in terms of the players entering this. And the classic, you know, in terms of D&D &D are the dark domains of the Ravenloft setting. Think of Barovia in the Curse of Strahd. You know, these have been created by some you know, demigod or god or very powerful creatures as kind of a one-way prison. That is, it's easy to get in there, but very difficult to get back out. And next you have the forbidden place that I'm going to put under the category of power. And I think of these as where there has been some sort of cataclysmic event that has affected this area and the effects of it when, you know, humanoids or player characters enter, these effects are too powerful for them uh, to withstand. Hence, uh, it is called forbidden. You know, in real life, you have the area around the Chernobyl nuclear plant, right? Uh, you're not supposed to go there. The radiation will make you sick. And in film, you have the very cleverly named Forbidden Zone of the first Planet of the Apes movie. Uh, this is an area of what once was, you know, two or three thousand years before New York City. And it suffered nuclear strikes and is now, you know, this devoid of life and everything. But it contains the secrets of this, you know, prior civilization. Hence, the apes, chimps, and orangutans that run the Planet of the Apes have declared it forbidden, off limits. And when I first started playing D&D, you know, the post-apocalyptic theme was very much on our minds because in the 70s, we kind of lived under the threat of that every day. So in terms of explaining our world, you know, my first world I created, the idea was it was post-apocalyptic, you know, many millennia later, <clears throat> and magic had been sourced because these nuclear strikes and the radiation or distortion of reality, whatever magic powers were derived from that. And I had this area... Uh, that we, we call the Forbidden Zone, you know, after the movie. And it was based here. And as you can see, the geography of this area had these five-mile-wide fissures. These were remains of the nuclear strikes. 
And within this area, you had all sorts of you know mutations of monsters and things. And you also had bizarre magical effects such that ordinary magic spells could be distorted, you know, magnified or reversed or just you know nulled out. The players had a love-hate relationship with this. Uh, they knew there were all sorts of cool encounters and you know technology and ancient technology and stuff like this, you know, which would be modern. But they also knew deadly creatures and their magic might be warped. And then finally, you have a forbidden area that is controlled by some powerful entity, and they don't want anyone inside. You know, think about the you know Japan uh, before the West kind of forced themselves in the forbidden city within Beijing. And then, of course, on a smaller scale, you have something like a prison. You know, you're not supposed to go in there or a keep uh, similar to the Forbidden City, but it's just on a smaller scale. And this is an important thing to think about in terms of a forbidden area. You can scale it down. It doesn't have to be some vast geographic area. It could be one hex. Uh, it could be a town or a village. It could be a single keep or a dungeon that is forbidden. And the thing about these, they're manageable. We're always trying to keep things simple. And you can run them as a one or, you know, two session adventure. All right, so next we have forbidden items. These, you know, the same schema here. Uh, there are items that have been cursed. There are items that are simply too powerful for ordinary mortals to employ. And there are items that are protected by someone, either the creator or the person that controls it. They don't want anyone else to touch it. So a classic cinematic power item is the mental enhancement device in the film Forbidden Planet, created by the Kroll, the super powerful ancient race. Morbius, who's the guy that runs the planet, he had enough mental power to withstand it. Uh, ordinary humans, you put it on and your brains are frazzled. Of course, this creates this id monster that destroys people. Uh, check out the film, it's, it's cool. You know, and of course you have the cursed item. You can have the classic just D&D simple curse. It looks like a plus one sword, but lo and behold, it's minus one and you can't get rid of it. You know, you're totally under its control or whatever. That's how we used to do things. But you can get a little more creative with a cursed item. There's a famous short story by M.R. James called Whistle and I'll Come For You. And it's about this professor in this remote area of England. He finds these old graves from like, you know, Anglo-Saxon times. And there's this little uh, whistle carved out of stone. And it says, whistle and I'll come for you. He does whistle and it creates this sort of invisible stalker creature that starts haunting him. He sees it on the seashore and then it comes into his room at night and messes with him. And it, you know, fills him totally with dread. And the thing about this creature is because the professor has no idea how to control it or give it commands, it just starts to attack him. And finally, of course, the powerful item that is designed for a specific group or one user. I use the Ark of the Covenant, classic example. Uh, and if you don't, aren't that group or don't know how to make the item think you are, you are in trouble. And then, of course, you have forbidden knowledge. And the classic example in literature is the Necronomicon created by H.P. Lovecraft, which, you know, talks about the secrets of the Cthulhu. And it contains knowledge that is so foreign to the human mind that it will drive you insane if you read it. And I cover this on my cliche of the mad NPC, so check that out. But I would call the Necromonicon um, uh, too powerful to read as opposed to cursed, because a cursed item, I think in terms of D&D, you know, divine or uh, arcane magic that uh, curses those uh, who use it that aren't, you know, say of the right alignment or whatever. Let's say you have the, you know, a book of infernal secrets about demonology. If you don't worship that demon or, you know, are not in under its control, you are going to be cursed. You are going to have some evil effect. As opposed to something that, you know, isn't necessarily, you know, magic, but just is information that is strictly controlled. So if you have a map to some place where there's a treasure, or you have something, let's say, in a keep where it shows all the, you know, secret areas of a dungeon or just a map of that dungeon, whoever controls it, you know, doesn't want just anyone to get a hold of this. So items like this are closely guarded, and if they are removed from their hiding spot, you know, or even if they are red, maybe there's some kind of alarm system on here. The person that made this might just know and come find out who's looking at my item. Because unlike, say, a treasure item or something that's valuable because it's rare, it's valuable because it has information that whoever put it there doesn't want anyone to know. All right, so now that we've defined our terms and sort of the subcategories, now how do you incorporate forbidden places, items, or knowledge into your world such that it reflects the kind of grandeur you know, and uh, horror and scariness that these items should invoke in the player characters. When I say grandeur, it just reminds your players that they're in a world where there's things far bigger than, right? There's more under the stars than the mere statistics of your PCs. 
And when you have a cataclysm that left behind a forbidden area where it's dangerous to go and everything, it also creates a sense of history to your world. You know, the current state of affairs that the players find it didn't just spring out of nothing. There's a chain of events. There's a history to this world that leads up to, you know, the current situation at hand. And this should influence how you present a forbidden uh, place, item, or knowledge to the players. You know, if people speak of the forbidden zone, it should be in hushed tones or not spoken at all. You know, uh, everyone knows there's a threat to this. There's a history to this. And, you know, they're going to be very careful about who they talk to about it. And there's a sense of grandeur, you know, in this, I guess, negative sense. You know, a cursed sword that's forbidden isn't just a minus one sword. It is the sword of defiance, once wielded by Dragos the Unclean, who will return to haunt the dreams of anyone who dares attempt to use it. All right, so I'm going to start with place and talk about, you know, presenting it to the players and thinking about its background. Well, first of all, let's say it's a big geographic area. Uh, it's going to be known by those areas that surround it, right? The people that live in towns or the humanoids or whatever. Uh, they're going to know all about, you know, this area you don't go to. And these stories that they have, which may or may not be accurate, are going to be part of the reveal that you give to the players when they come into this area. So if there was some sort of cataclysm, people will have some kind of memory about it, stories about it. Now, I tend to put these cataclysms in the distant past because that makes it simpler. I usually have so that no one is alive anymore that was, you know, witness to this. Uh, and that way you don't have survivors that you have to, you know, get up all their statistics or trying to get back in there or whatever. You just have these stories, these legends, and generally speaking, you know, common people and any super normal types with any brains just don't go there, your players will. So you think about what happened and what are the logical after effects. Let's say there was some cataclysmic battle between two very powerful forces, you know, two liches or wizards, and all this magic was blasted forth. They called forth, you know, planar creatures or whatever, and there's a huge disruption. So now you have wild magic and everything in this area, you know, this after effect. And if you have a cursed area such as Barovia, you've got to think about who would do this, typically a god or something. There has to be some transgression that was so serious that, you know, perhaps by a whole community of people or an individual that they, you know, trapped them in sort of this pocket dimension. Think about the warriors in the Army of the Dead in Lord of the Rings. They broke their sacred oath to Isilgard. Because of that, they were all doomed to be in these, you know, caves of the dead until, you know, they reaffirmed their oath, which Aragorn conveniently allows them to do. The thing is, Isildur didn't have the power to invoke such a curse. Someone else, we don't know who did. Doesn't matter. What's important here is the crime, the breaking of a sacred oath, some transgression that just goes against everything of, you know, civilization. And the locals knew about the caves of the dead and avoided them. Now, you also want to think about the effects upon the players when they go into an area that is forbidden. So you have this sort of malaise and unease and then corruption of player characters who enter Barovia. You can also have nightmares. You know, each night they, the players go there, they have these nightmares that disrupt their sleep. Again, you can have, you know, roles uh, for uh, some kind of mental duress, some kind of confusion. The other thing is if they're not getting sleep, you can start to have exhaustion creep up on the group. And you can reduce spell effectiveness, fighting effectiveness, you know, however you want to do it, however powerful. You know, this is, it's just a how, what is the after effects of this forbidden area? And in the cataclysmic area, you can have the same sort of effects. You know, what I did was I changed the way magic works. Some spells would be, you know, elaborately expanded or not work at all or be totally different. You know, if you want to keep it simple, you can use the wild magic table that's given in the player's handbook. You can also homebrew this and change it any way you want. It just depends on how much work you want to do. Then you have physical changes, you know, increase or decrease in gravity. You can change the way light works. You know, at night it's so pitch dark that dark vision doesn't do anything. Uh, light gives only a radius of like 10 feet. And you can scale that area down, as I said, to a forbidden, you know, town or a forbidden dungeon or keep. You can have this such that it has similar effects. You know, and when you have a forbidden, you know, dungeon that some powerful creature doesn't want anyone to visit, you're going to have all sorts of traps, barriers, whatnot, alarms that go off if the, the players try to enter them. But notice the theme here. There's an intensity to the source or purpose that you've assigned to this item such that it has the status as forbidden. So for an item example, as a GM, think about why the creator would invest such effort and covet this, you know, this item with such intensity that it would 
you know, put guards on it that would give it that forbidden status. Then you work it into the functionality of the item. So let's say the whistle that I mentioned earlier, let's say that it was created by a lich long ago that called forth, you know, a, an invisible stalker type creature. I would magnify its powers considerably. Then it would use, you know, whenever it was in a super emergency situation, blow the whistle, it's right there. The thing about it is this powerful invisible stalker greatly resented being summoned this way, but the lich was very powerful. There was nothing it could do. So now we're in very many millennium into the future. The lich is long dead. The player characters find the whistle. If they blow it, if they summon this super invisible stalker, now it gets a chance to take its revenge because the players not knowing anything about this, just blowing it, they're not gonna be able to fight this thing. Now, perhaps there's ways they can research this, they can talk to an NPC or do whatever and figure out how to use this, how to you know control this thing, but it's gonna to be tough. Or if it's knowledge that someone has created to protect, let's say you have a, you know, a series of scrolls that show all of the code words for secret doors and some treasure thing, you know, all sorts of magic. Now, the person that made this knows they wanna protect this, so they've worked into this what seems ordinary text, it's actually spell. When you read this, it invokes a spell and brings trouble down on whoever's reading it. You know, there might be four spells of damage or, you know, fear or confusion or something, but you can actually be more creative. You know, think of the effects that I described for the forbidden place, a growing sense of malaise, a growing madness, maybe exhaustion, you know, maybe it, it you know, plants some sort of impulse in whoever has read this. Now, there's an important point of order here in that you must warn the players whether, you know, about a forbidden place item uh, or knowledge. You can't just have them cross over a mountain range and suddenly they're in a land where the spells are going back, why are they becoming exhausted or they're being poisoned or something like that. Uh, they find a whistle, they blow it, and they're ripped to shreds by some invisible creature they, they can't even see or harm. You know, we've talked about humanoids in a surrounding, you know, if you have a forbidden area that are going to know about this. Uh, you know, in the Caves of the Dead, in Lord of the Rings, people knew about this and, you know, they wouldn't go there. But, you know, you can also have warnings that, you know, add a little more flavor to your world. Remember when Aragorn, Legolas, and Gimli approached the Caves of the Dead, they palpably felt this is a terrible place. Their horses, which were highly trained, ran off, you know, and they literally had to run across the threshold to get themselves to go into this place. You know, whispers coming from the cave, dread in their bones. Use this kind of information, sensory, mental effects, weird noises to guide your players that, hey, you're either going into an area of deadliness or when you pick up this whistle, something about it, there's some sort of, you know, a cold chill runs down your spine. Think of how a horror movie always introduces the, you know, evil spot. Because common folk and even a lot of adventurers, they get these warnings, they get these feelings, and they stay away. The player characters are going to be attracted to it. They're the protagonist, the antagonist of your world. They're going to want to explore this. They're going to know, hey, it's an adventure hook or whatever. But give them fair warning. Let them know what they're getting into. So there you have some ideas on using the forbidden in your own campaign. And if you like what you've seen on my channel, please subscribe. I'm always looking for more. Leave some comments because I love to read them and answer them. But most importantly, as always, keep playing this game that we love, D&D, and tell somebody else about it.